Hello, and welcome to the Happy Musicians Podcast, where it's not about getting the gig, it's about enjoying the gig. I'm your host, Tanner Guess, and this week I am joined by Jonathan Bauer. Jonathan is a Canadian-born trumpet player. He lives down here in New Orleans, and he's a fantastic person. He leads his own internationally touring group, the Jonathan Bauer Project, and he gigs with them regularly around town playing original black American music. And he also plays with several awesome groups in the city, including the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. Our conversation is a bit on the lengthy side, maybe, for some of the podcasts that we've done in the past, but I think it's really awesome. And a lot of it focuses on maybe my search for a working definition or conceptualization of the perfect gig trying to find a situation wherein as a band leader you're happy and fulfilled with the music that's being made and also setting up a situation where the musicians involved are happy and fulfilled the venue and the owners are excited about what you're doing and feel like they're also being fulfilled and then also you have the audience their perspective is the audience having a good time? And that's a pretty tall order, and I think it can be helpful to look at it from everyone's perspective, but there is also maybe ways that Jonathan presents things, focusing on the music first instead of trying to make everyone happy that really help. I don't know. I think looking at our, ent- our conversation as a whole, trying to just approach that from these different perspectives is the best way to to get through this it maybe seems like we go on some tangents but for me it felt like everything really connected we also talk about quitting gigs we talk about going through music school and something John calls jazz guilt that I think is a very real thing and we're talking about and talk about honesty and self-assessment there's a lot of great stuff in here I think it's a great conversation and I'm not gonna preface it anymore I hope you enjoy thank you so much for being here and please help me welcome Jonathan Bauer. Jonathan Bauer, welcome to the Happy Musicians Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I know. Since I've moved to town, <coughs> I've gotten a lot of great advice from you. Um, always seem to come at the right times, and I'm excited to share that with people now. And one thing I want to talk to you about is being a band leader, because um, mm. it's a different role than as a sideman. And you have a lot of responsibility. And the one thing I'm curious about is how you approach setting up a situation where you feel fulfilled musically and you're enjoying the gig. And then also you have to keep in mind the perspective of your band and you want to make sure that they're enjoying the gig. And then there's also the aspect of the audience, you know, like, are they enjoying it as well? And then you have an obligation to the venue that you're playing at to make sure that it's a good situation for them. So there's just a lot of people's perspectives and needs that you need to be in mind of as a band leader. And I'm curious how you balance all that. And maybe we can go one by one or just take your get your take on the whole thing. Um, yeah, let's, maybe let's, <clears throat> maybe let's break it down into some different categories. Um, you know, I would, I would say, um, I would, I would say first and foremost that, uh, you know, my, um, uh, my reasoning for becoming a band leader, uh, was that, you know, I was, I was living in New Orleans. I'd been here for, I'd been here for a few years. Um, and if I'm being honest, just not a lot of people were calling me to play the type of music that I was most passionate about. Mm. And uh, somebody just gave me the piece of advice where they said, well, you know, if you want to be, if you want to, if you want to play the type of music that you want to play, why don't you book your own gig? And, you know, they kind of, they kind of said it a little sarcastically, but uh, I thought it was pretty good advice. So my, you know, my main, uh, my main reason for kind of becoming a band leader was, uh, I don't necessarily like the word control, but, uh, but to, yeah, to create a space where I knew that I would be kind of artistically fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that like, regardless of what was going on in the rest of my life, artistically and work-wise, or regardless of what was with what was going on with my other gigs, uh, having my own project gave me a space to best focus my energies, you know? Yeah. So instead of, instead of, um, 
maybe com- complaining to people or myself or uh, about the fall and the shortcomings of some gig, whether it's, um, you know, we're playing only top 40 music or I'm playing Uptown Funk five times a night or, you know, whatever it, it might be. Um, you know, I won't get into too, I won't get into like specifics on any, on any gig, but I could, I could take, I could go home and I could focus that energy into like, okay, well, like, what can I do to make my project better? Instead yeah. Of, instead of, instead of wasting my time, um, wondering how I can make somebody else's vision mm-hmm. of success or somebody else's vision for their music more like my vision for my music. Yeah. You know, taking these gigs that are, for whatever reason, there are facets of it that are frustrating and using that as an opportunity to see how do I not do that thing for well, my own group? Absolutely. And also just um, when I created a uh, when I created an avenue for my own artistic endeavors, I was also able to better compartmentalize my uh, gigs for what they were. You know, I didn't when I had, when I started having my own space to, uh, that, that needed kind of specific things artistically, I started needing those things less from other people's gigs Mm. and those ways in which I might not have done things became less important to me because that was fine. That's, that's their project. And I'm here to fulfill, I'm here to fulfill their vision of what they're doing. And I'll worry about my vision of what I'm doing when I, you know, when I'm with my band. Yeah. And, you know, being able to compartmentalize like that did a lot for my, uh, did a lot for my longevity. When I, once I, once I was able to, that, I like that word compartmentalize and like put, put things kind of in the boxes of what they were and not, not expect things from them that they didn't, that they didn't have the ability to provide, mm. you know? And so being a band leader in your own right, did it give you more of an appreciation or a perspective of being a sideman and thinking about whatever leaders band that you're in trying to see like, what do they want from me to best fulfill like what they're trying to accomplish as a band? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it created a, a lot of insight as to how difficult it is and just kind of what goes into what goes into having a band. And, um, Honestly, for some people, like it, it helped me to realize how difficult it is to have a high level of clarity and how difficult it is to have, you, you know, that, that, that clarity transfer over into what you're trying to do musically. So it just did. Yeah, it created a lot. It created a space for me to have a lot more sympathy and mm-hmm. understanding, you know, which, yeah. which again, just went a long way for me uh, in my day to day of like being able to being able to <laughs> allow some of those frustrations to subside because yeah. they they had new they had new light shone upon them hmm. you know that's cool um, as for uh, as for creating a situation in which in which everybody is in which everybody is happy um, that's it's it's weird some days it feels really easy and some days it feels really difficult hmm. um, but I find the first and foremost thing is, I know, I know it might sound obvious to say this, but you really need to prioritize hiring the right people for the gig. Um, and that, that means a lot of different things, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, the, the, you, you've got, you've got to be like, for lack of a, you know, better where you've got to be killing enough for the gig. Like you've got to be able to play the gig, but it also comes down to like, maybe you swing differently than we're trying to swing or, or I'm trying to swing or, uh, you know, maybe the personalities just don't match or maybe you're just bringing something to the table that is aesthetically not on a, like on a fundamental level, not what we're trying to do. So it's like, it really comes down to, you've got to hire the right people. Cause when you do that, then, you know, it's kind of like those the stars line up, <clears throat> and when everybody's when everybody's kind of like on the same fundamental page on the bandstand, it it opens up 
a door to sort of a, a higher echelon of swing. Yeah. You know, you're, you're able to, you're able to dig deep into the wells and reserves of your collective knowledge and your, your collective experiences and create music that's unencumbered by you having to figure out how the other musicians, how to play with the other musicians. Yeah. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I was just thinking of like frequencies, like waves, when you have the same frequency, the wave line up and even if they're the same volume, when they're the same, they'll amplify each other and you get a louder noise because they're on the same wavelength. Oh, I like that. And there's like, there's this book, um, good to great. I think the author's Jim Hans, Jim Collins. I think that's his name. Um, but one of the, it's about like these businesses that um, like did exceptionally well. And one thing they all had in common was that same idea of they got the right people on board mm -hmm. to grow with. And yeah. um, it's hard to go somewhere if you have someone in the band who's like not interested in going there, you know? Yep. And, and you know, it, um, it, it just makes a difference in the long run in that like there are so many things you need to do as a band as a band leader but as a band to to achieve what whatever it is that you consider to be successful or to be success um and if your musicians aren't there for kind of the same reasons as you it's it's going to be more difficult you know like um you definitely i'm not saying i i think i think band leaders ask for too many favors from from musicians i think there's i think there's too much of this like um hey man come play these really sad gigs with me um in hopes that 10 to 15 years from now you're somehow still in my band and we're traveling all over the world mm. you know what i mean and and band leaders sometimes i feel put too much uh too much responsibility on their musicians to uh, to kind of do their job for them and in, invest in their in their in like the band leaders for lack of a better word product for them hmm. um, and that and that is inc incredibly difficult if the musicians don't believe in what you're doing. You know what I mean? So you're when you when you're asking for these favors from the wrong, you know, when you're asking for these things from the wrong musicians, then you're asking people who don't care about your music and don't care about your person and aren't invested time wise or emotionally in your in your in your art uh, to do something that's going to be incredibly difficult for them. But if you like really focus down on finding the right people, it's like they're they're going to be along for the ride. You know what I mean? They're going to be they're going to be there with you every step of the way. And uh, you know, I, I prioritize finding the right people. And when I started doing my project, it was just me by myself doing kind of all the clerical work. But the guys in my band are so invested that like next thing I know. I've got a business partner and the next thing I know I've got my bass player wants to wants to clean up our charts and create like really nice books for the subs and like mm -hmm. our uh, piano players showing up with all sorts of arrangement ideas to our rehearsals and it's just like when you find the right people it it's it's the the benefits are exponential you know you go from you go from being one person pushing a giant boulder up the steepest hill too, just like even, even two people pushing that boulder starts making it feel incredibly easier, you know? And, uh, yeah, like I think on its, I think in its fundamental level, it's like, it's about putting the right people together who are, who are all very clearly invested in the same, in the same kind of art that you're trying to make, you know? Um, and you know, just to, to step back a moment to where I said like you know I, I first started doing this because people weren't really calling me to play the music that I was most passionate about um, 
you know, then, then immediately after I started, after I started having a band, those same people that weren't booking me were treating me like a peer and asking me and being like, Hey man, let me know if, you know, if you ever need a drummer, let me know. You know what mm. I mean? So it's like people weren't booking me for their gigs and I started a band and now they want me to book them on my gig. And it really went a lot. It really kind of went a long way in my development of understanding that the actions of other people have nothing to do with you. Mm. And there are, there are countless reasons why you're not getting, why you didn't get that gig. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and very seldomly, if you're putting in the, if you're putting in the work, very seldomly is that reason because you're not good enough. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's something that I could say very personally, when you first show up to like a new place and you're just really eager to be working, you know, and if you, if you can play, you know, you at least have hit that threshold of whatever that is, you know, but you kind of know if you're like, I can hang. Um, and you're like, I can, I can do these gigs. Why am I not getting called for these gigs? And the, the first reason you always come up with is, Oh, it's like, I guess I'm just not good enough or they don't think I'm good enough or like you, you have to prove it or something, but it's really just like, I guess how I see it now is that they're calling people who they've known for a long time that they're friends with, like that they yep. can hang out with, you know, that, Yep. These are musicians that they're comfortable with and whether or not you can play better than them isn't the issue. It, like you have to build up rapport and trust yeah. first. And, I'm, and I, I also, I mean this like, uh, I mean this with zero disrespect to anybody in the world, but this is also a reason why, why having an accurate self-assessment is one of the most important tools you can have mm -hmm. being a full-time professional musician is is being able to genuinely look at your abilities and your skills and and like accurately assess them and to and to recognize that like while I said seldomly like sometimes sometimes it is that like sometimes it is that you know they're they're doing something that you're not even aware of yet you know what I mean you might look you might look back at the gigs you didn't get a few years from now and be like, yeah, I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. But you know, if you, if you can, if you can form an accurate self-assessment, um, if you could just be honest with yourself, like really both brutally and beautifully honest with your, with yourself, you can, you can kind of hone in on where both in the scene and in your practice, you should be spending your time. You should be, uh, you know, focusing your efforts, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, sorry, that was that was a tangent. Not really. Oh. Not <laughs> but I guess with self-assessment and maybe more thinking as a sideman for a second, if you're, um, as a leader, making sure you get the right people on board for the project, and if you're uh, being asked as a musician to get involved in projects, I think having self-assessment and really thinking like, if this is something I'm going to commit to, am I going to feel fulfilled and enjoy this? Or am I just getting myself in, in a situation where I'll make some money, but I'm just going to leave the gig feeling frustrated, you know? Right. And, and, you know, um, I, I, I really do try to keep, um, and uh, mm, mm, an understanding of the perspective of new musicians to town mm -hmm. and developing, you know, younger developing musicians in town, uh, because I recognize that at a certain point, um, at, at a certain point, your your goal was to be able to like play well enough to do some gigs, and that bar kind of keeps moving. As you know, as you're as you're developing, you know the you're, then you then you're good enough to play some gigs, and that bar moves forward, and you find yourself being like, okay, well now I need to be good enough to play enough gigs to make a living. I need to be good enough to make a living, and then you're good enough to make a living, and that bar that bar just keeps moving, and then you go, okay, well now I want to be good enough to make a living only playing music that I'm passionate about. Hmm. You know, you would start wanting to be choosy and such like that, and. Um, 
really at a certain point for me, it hit this space where I was, you know, I was, I was making enough as a musician that, uh, you know, my partner said to me, why, why are you, why are you playing this gig tonight? You don't, you don't want to do this gig tonight. You don't need to do this gig tonight. Why are you doing this gig tonight? And as a freelance artist, my answer was to be like, well, you, you never know when those paychecks are going to disappear. I need to be like a, a squirrel getting ready mm-hmm. for the winter. <laughs> like I need to, I need to take every gig Forging. I can because yeah. I, yeah, I need to like, I need to stockpile this, these, you know, I need to stack this paper so that when it's, when it's slow, I'm taken care of. Um, but as the words came out of my mouth, I was like, wow, that's not why I'm here. Mm. You know, like, yes, obviously you need to be making enough money to, uh, to take care of yourself, to, to make a living, but your priorities as a musician, specifically as a musician in some place like New Orleans, where this is a cultural music should, I'm not going to tell people how to live. But I felt that my priorities should be on uh, should be on learning as much from my elders as possible and finding the ways in which I love New Orleans the most and being here because I love being here, not being here because it's paying my bills, mm. you know, so being like uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to step back from this concept of like being so focused on stacking up cash and recognize that you you can stack up cash anywhere and if it's about stacking up cash then like if it's only about stacking up cash then like go do something else like you really really need to find that balance of like seeking out mentorship from seeking out mentorship from those that you think are incredible you mm-hmm. know and and uh and be more obsessed with that like yeah take care of yourself take care of your family take care of your money uh but like but you really need to prioritize those things that are like why am i doing this why am i making why am i making art what am i doing to fulfill my need to be better in this art form not what am i doing to fulfill my need to make more money because like i've i don't know i've just kind of found the two things sort of come hand in hand that the more i focus on how do i make more money the more depressed I get and the more I like you know the more I get upset about the money I'm making or the money I'm not making and just that my life is driven by by numbers and then the more I focus on why is it that I love playing the trumpet why is it that I I continue every day to wake up and rededicate myself to this music and when I when I focus my energies on those thoughts somehow I make more money and I also am not depressed all the time. Yeah. That's, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's all super true. And I totally resonate with it. And I guess all this stuff kind of feeds together and finding the right people. And yeah. also just like, <laughs> thanks for bringing me back. <laughs> well, no, it, I mean, it, it ties in, I feel like here too. And that if you're, if your reason for dedicating yourself to music is like this certain style or this sound and you're in a place where like that just doesn't exist you can fight the good fight and like try to establish it but you also might just not be being honest with yourself you're kind of fighting an uphill battle whereas if you went somewhere else you might have a lot more success even if it's a more daunting location yeah absolutely um you know my belief on the matter was First off, I mean, I moved to New Orleans. Uh, the biggest part of why I moved to New Orleans is that the majority of my favorite musicians are from New Orleans. Mm. And I wanted to be part of that. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to understand where they came from. And I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to know that culture. And sometimes I feel like, you're, you're right, people come here because, you know, they went to school and wherever and somebody said to them like well if you move to new orleans there's enough gigs and they think that they're going to come here and i meet a lot of people i've had people reach out to me and say like hey man i'm moving to new orleans um do you have any like tips on uh venues where like i can book my band 
and I catch myself being like, why are you coming here? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> why are you, why are you coming here? The culture, the culture surround, the culture that this music is surrounded by, um, has been here long before you. It will be here long after you. And I find the reason to come here is, is, is not to attempt to change that or not to attempt to, to thrust yourself upon it, but to, to come here because it's like, you want this culture to change you. You want this culture to, you want to learn from it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I really do tell people when they, when they come here to like prioritize just going out as much as possible and being a side man, because there's so much, there's so much here for you to learn and being a band leader takes up so much time and effort that if that it, it you know a lot of that can go on the back burner if you're not careful you really need to prioritize um you really not need to prioritize like what it is you love about the city that you're in and uh and you know hone hone in on that and participate in that way which is what i i, I tell you know especially young people um you know so my i, I like to tell stories um my brother, my younger brother was uh, coming up on graduating from high school and I live, I grew up in a very, like, I grew up in a very particular part of Canada. Um, uh, I don't want to talk ill on it or anything like that. You know, like I, I had a great, I had a great childhood, uh, but, uh, but I wanted for my brother to leave the mm. way that I left. I wanted him to go gain a slightly more worldly experience. And he was moving from our hometown to an adjacent location, similar to our hometown in Alberta, still in Alberta. And I said to him, I was like, man, why don't you, you know, why don't you at least move to, you know, why don't you go check out uh, Vancouver? Um, you know, we've got family there. Why don't you go check out Toronto? Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a lot of friends in Toronto. I could connect, could connect you with people. You'd have a community there. You know, if you wanted to take a year off, you could come live with me in New Orleans. And he said something that, you know, made me really sad. He said, uh, John, not everybody has big dreams like you. And it really took me back because I just thought I just moved to another city. You know, I didn't, I didn't ever think of what I was doing as being like big dreams. I just thought I, I just thought I moved to another city. And so it, it dawned on me that this, this idea of taking bets on yourself can be difficult for some people. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm here to say like, if you have the means to do so, do it. You know what I mean? If you have the means to, to go to the place and live in the place where your favorite music comes from, specifically if you're attempting to participate in that art form. If you have the means to go there, go there. You know, and I understand not everybody does. Like, I understand that life provides different people with different circumstances. And like, maybe, maybe the th maybe leaving your your comfort, the comfort of your hometown, is impossible for you because you take care of four children or whatever may have you. You don't have the means to leave. But if you do have the means to leave, if you do have the means to go where that thing you are passionate is, uh, is from, do so. Even, and I'm not even talking about like just New Orleans. Like if you came to New Orleans because you thought there was going to be enough work and that was your primary reason for coming to New Orleans, but you really wished you'd gone to New York, like, damn, why'd you come here? Yeah. You know, why did you, you know, <laughs> prioritize going where, where you think that that community will actually make you happiest. Yeah. You know, and then be killing and hope for, hope for the best, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rolling way back. I like <laughs> everywhere we went, but I think there's still a bit more we could get to just being in that leadership position. Cause I feel like everything we just talked about really encapsulates setting yourself up in a situation where the gig that you're creating is enjoyable for you as a leader, the music you're playing, and then also for the musicians that you're hiring, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think hopefully most people get that far, at least of thinking beyond themselves and they think about their band, like how can I like make this enjoyable for them too? And I think the next level that's important as far as just having that awareness and empathy for everyone involved is like, is what I'm creating going to be valuable and fun for my audience? And how do you approach that? 
because like understanding what your audience values and and how to deliver something for them well this this is and this is definitely one of those like age-old questions um when i when i first moved to new orleans i had the uh the distinct honor and pleasure to do a show with the great mr ellis marcellus that was put on through the university of new orleans and he said to me, if you play for the audience's applause, that's all you'll ever get. You know, and that that really resonated with me is that uh, this this to me is is a social music. And this is a music that's that's meant to be enjoyed and it's meant to connect with people. But like, I do believe that first and foremost, like that can't be your reason for it. Mm. You know, like. Uh, I do believe that there's like there's there is something sort of fundamentally selfish in in being an artist and in being a musician where like if you aren't happy how are you going to make your audience happy so it's if you are bending every last aspect of your music into something that it's not just in order to make an audience of people you don't know clap for you then it's, you know, like, what's, what's the point? Why are we here? I, I, now I say this understanding that I am, maybe the word is fortunate enough to hear this music and play this music in a way that is palatable. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, like, I, I don't necessarily hear or play like esoteric things that most audiences aren't going to be able to connect with. And that's not due to me attempting to not be esoteric. That's just due to the fact that the way that I hear this music seems to kind of be the way that a lot of people like to hear this music. Um, but that being said, it doesn't keep you from having the, the, the truth of the matter is you need to find that audience, you know, like, there's no, there's no need to bend your music to an audience if you found the audience that likes, that loves your music the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And there in turn comes the difference between, where I said, I said to you earlier, it's like there in turn comes kind of the difference between gigs and shows. You know, like, is this, is it, or like, or like a job and art. It's, it, and you have to be able to kind of compartmentalize the difference between the two. You know, you have to understand that like some gigs are a job. Some gigs are, there is an audience in front of you that did not come for you. You know, they didn't come there because they heard that Jonathan Bauer was playing at that bar. They just are tourists that stumbled into that bar and they're there for a drink or you get hired to do some private function and they want some just like, they just want like a standards trio and uh, as opposed to a show where it's like you are there to play your music. You've advertised that you're there to play your music. If you, it's, I, you know, not to sound like a dick, but I'm like, if you don't want to hear my music, don't come. Mm -hmm. And build build on your audience of those people that are passionate about your music, and make your make your art for make your art for your from and make your art from the most genuine place that you can, and keep building that audience of pe of people who love your music the the genuine way in which you create it you know so it, it really comes down to like i have i am flexible with my job i'm i'm not flexible with my art mm. you know that makes a lot of sense yeah and it comes what? it's it's really about it's really the, the it's really on you as the band leader to understand the difference between the two and again like i said earlier not get upset that a, a gig is not providing you with something that you knew going in, it wasn't going to provide, mm -hmm. you know, like if you knew going in that, that, that you're playing at some bar that like asked you to come play uptown funk and you show up with your like original, uh, your, your like original straight ahead improvised music. And you can't be upset when that venue then goes like, why aren't you playing uptown funk? You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can't, you can't expect things from gigs that you know, aren't there. So it's really about like focusing your energies 
on creating spaces where your music is going to be your music is going to be received well yeah and I, the special thing about a show especially with more artistic music is that it it's designed and created from a place to get the audience to think you know and you need a space where they aren't distracted by commotion and it's not about like the drinks and the rambunctious attitude like a listening space where people have a chance to digest that and when in new orleans like you have all these bars situations that most of them are just full of tourists and i don't know if you're expecting (laughs) to play pretty avant-garde stuff that takes a lot of time to digest and you need to be in the right headspace i'm like have you ever been on a vacation because yeah. I feel so stressed out on vacations. You spend a lot of money and you're just in this space, this new place where you're overwhelmed for a short amount of time and you're kind of desperately running around to all these different things. Like you you need to understand that about your clientele. Like in New Orleans, I guess I'm speaking to, but this is probably true for a lot of places like this where like your audience is just like probably pretty confused and they're just looking to have a good time and get the most for their money and you need to understand that you need to give them something that while they're in that headspace they can understand on like a job gig yeah uh, yeah and that's that's definitely what i'm talking about is like you can't um yeah you can't you can't expect every uh, especially in a in a tourist in a, in a city that is driven by the tourist by the tourism industry is like you can't expect every group of people that walks through the door to be like excited about what you're doing people have different tastes and you're like when you're on frenchman street like they're walking around from club to club to club to club to club and they just might not like what you're doing and they might like what some other person is doing you know what i mean and um like yeah you know in those moments it's like you kind of have your you kind of have your choice of like, uh, you, you, yeah, you have a choice of what to do. And my answer is not to fundamentally change what you're doing though. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm, we're talking about, we're talking about small differences. We're talking about like, um, maybe, maybe leaving a few more esoteric songs off the set list when I do my job gigs. And we're talking about like maybe taking some shorter, or some like less rambunctious solos on the job gigs. Uh, we're not talking about like being on stage, playing straight ahead, you know, music, and uh, and then noticing that the audience isn't into it, and then looking back at your band and being like, uh, uh, "All right, guys, brown eyed girl." Like we're not talking yeah. about like fundamentally changing what you're doing. We're just talking about like recognizing that there is a difference between what the audience has come for at a, mm-hmm. at a job gig versus your show. Yeah. And just having the awareness of like, maybe not every song needs to be 15 minutes and really dense the whole time. You that's know? a, that's a big pet peeve of mine. You know, it's, um, um, uh, you know, like, yeah, like there's, you don't, this is this is this this feels kind of unrelated to what we're talking about however like I, i'm happy to talk about it it's like you don't have to you don't have to get house on every single song you know what i mean you don't have to like um i find like you know if the band goes out there and the first song hits and i i'm like you know i take my trumpet solo and at the end the audience just goes like you know they're they're good for it they're like yeah we're here for this hell yeah that was that was a lot of fun. And then by like the second, third song, the trumpet solo ends and they're, they're still clapping. And then like by the third, by like the fourth, fifth trumpet solo, they're like song. They're like, okay, didn't we, didn't we just hear this? You know, I'm getting mm-hmm. a little bored. Didn't you just give us everything you had for the past three songs, four songs? It was like, you know, there's, there's something to be said about cultivating your entire show to have an, an ebb and flow and a climax to it that lets an audience like takes an audience on like a holistic journey instead of just like throwing everything you've got at them every single song you know yeah but and i just think that's an unfair expectation to have 
of your audience when you do that because you're expecting them to have this heightened level of attention and enjoyment out of like <laughs> too often in my experience like it's like why is everyone in the band soloing on every tune like why are we like why is that happening i get we need to fill a long gig sometimes the gigs here are pretty long but you could do that with more songs or like do some different styles or change things up like there's other decisions you can make that might take a little bit more planning and work but it's not even about being like successful in my mind it's like having this awareness and connection with people when you're like people aren't disliking this because what i do isn't good it's that i'm not actually even thinking about what they wanted in the first place and when you cut yourself off from other people you're just setting yourself up to be isolated and frustrated well yeah yes i feel like that was a very that was that was kind of an audience perspective um way of saying what I, what I will say which is just that like um I uh, I think less about <laughs> hey you know I don't like saying this but like I, I worry and think less about the audience than I do the music you know because because if, if you if you the, the question I like to ask is like are you asking yourself, what does the music need from me? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, are you asking, what does the music actually need? And if you're looking out at the audience and you're worried about what the audience thinks, you're, you, you don't really have the mental capacity to be worried about what the audience thinks and actually, and also actually be worried about what the music is asking of you. Uh, but if you focus your energies more on what is the music asking of me, I think everybody will kind of enjoy themselves a little bit more because if you're you know like if you're on the gig and there's been like four solos already on this song and you as let's say you specifically you're a drummer mm -hmm. so like nine times out of ten people wait to give you the last solo yeah. and let's say there's been a saxophone solo and a trumpet solo and a piano solo and a bass solo and you as the drummer are just bored <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. i mean like if you catch yourself being like i'm actually bored it's not that anybody took a bad solo. It's just that like the this 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 song has kind of run its course. Um, the music is not asking for me to take a drum solo here. Yeah, it's like it's it's your it's your job as a musician to constantly be asking like, is this what the music needs? Is mm -hmm. this what the music is asking for? And if the if the answer is yes, then like great, go for it, do it. But if the answer is no, if the answer is like no, this is just me trying to get mine then it's like, you know, leave it alone. Yeah. You know, leave it alone. Focus on, focus your energies on like, what is the music actually need? And, uh, and you'll, you'll find new and invigorating ways that to please your audience. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And I guess maybe they do come hand in hand. And maybe it's just that in my mind, I think in order to, know what the music needs in the moment you have to have a pretty open mind and like an open heart if you will like you yeah, absolutely open to all those emotions and i just kind of come back to the word empathy a lot because you need to be thinking about and listening to everyone else's opinions that they're sharing with the music too to understand what the music wants yeah. and i think if you in doing so you're also opening yourself up to the listeners who are an important part of the music making experience and everything yeah. like it's just coming out of your own musical shell like but but the but the you know but you, I mean, you have to you serve have, the music and know you're doing a good job but serve the music but you do that by being open to everyone else and and you on on any gig you have the controlled variable which is the musicians that you've hired and the uncontrolled variable which is the audience that you have not hired you know mm. what i mean <laughs> you, have, you have no control over like who shows up to your gig right so it's you know, like the, the audience is going to participate differently depending on who's there. But you, you know, the musicians that you've hired and this keeps coming back to like hiring the right people for the gig. Uh, it, this is, this is a really difficult music. Like this is really, I'm, you know, I'm really trying my hardest not to swear. 
This is a really, you can. really, yeah. this, it's really fucking hard. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. And I don't want to sound like a dick when I say this, but I'm like, not everybody's killing at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, it, it really comes down to like, in order to, in order to like be genuinely asking, uh, am I serving the, to genuinely serve the music and ask is like, is this what the music needs? Like you need to have put in countless hours. You need to have put in countless hours of practice so that you have command of your instrument in a way that you can do whatever it is that the music is asking of you. You need to have command of this music in a way that you're not going to be limited in your, in your vocabulary, both, both as a soloist and as, as a on the spot arranger to, uh, to, you know, to be able to participate in whatever way the band has collectively decided that the music is asking them to do. And you need to have put in the hours of listening. Like you need to have put in a collective, collective hours of listening. We were, we were just on the road. Um, my Brian and Alex, my, my pianist and my bass player for those listening that uh, don't know who I am or who we are. Um, we were just on the road in Canada and for the, uh, just a little over a week that we were in Canada, um, we were in the same vehicle every day and we got really into this Ray Brown trio record called live at the Loa mm. with, um, um, uh, with Gene Harris on piano and oh, who's on drums? Um, Jeff Hamilton. Jeff Hamilton's on drums, and we got really into it. Like every day, we got into the car. It was. It wasn't even like it wasn't even funny or a joke. It wasn't like this this like inside joke that somebody kept putting this record on. It was like no, we kept putting this record on because it's killing, mm. and because the more we listened to it collectively. The more, and the more we like actively listened to it, the more we got to the gig and our, our vibe kind of started to sound like that, you know, yeah. it started to sound like that. All that Gene Harris stuff started coming through. So it's like, it really comes down to, this is, this is a very long winded way of saying like, this is really difficult and serving the music is really, it, it, there's, there's a bunch of difficult work that comes before it. But serving the music is just the easiest thing you can do because it's just all you, you just have to ask, is this what the music is asking of me? And your countless hours of practice and specifically listening will lead you to that answer. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the listening gives you informed decisions. I also feel like listening is just kind of a practice of being having an open mind and open ears to other people's ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're listening actively, you're listening to all these other instruments, not your own instrument, and hearing the ideas and valuing them. And then when you're on the bandstand, you're actively searching for people expressing themselves, you know? And if you're not listening actively, you can be listening in a way where you're maybe only listening to your own instrument or you're, you're listening for what you want to hear and not what for actually is being playing played you know yeah absolutely um, absolutely you know the, the situation changes mm -hmm. yeah the not every not everything is going to be ideally exactly the way that you heard it but it's it's your job as a musician to to adapt to that or or maybe you know like maybe uh you know maybe the rhythm section doesn't go where you think the music is asking you to go but like then it's then it's your job to kind of make that that impulsive decision to be like okay well do i do i go with them and do i figure out what it is that they're trying to do or do i do i double down and i show them what i'm trying to do you know mm. what i mean like there's these questions all happen in real time and it's yeah you know it's really hard like it takes a lot of effort it's not it's not something it's not something i'm very it's not something i'm casual about you know yeah i mean i practice to have these just to get it so that my hands are able to execute the music that I hear naturally, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's a, kind of a freedom so that there's no barrier in the way of me listening to other people on the stand, on my best days, you know? Like listening and honoring what they're playing by supporting it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I like that. I, that, I mean, sometimes, some I know, I know... 
like you and I sitting here, it might feel like we're saying things that are very obvious, but some, sometimes it just feels like they aren't, you know what I mean? Sometimes, oh, I, yeah. walk away, sometimes I walk away from a gig and it, it's, it's, it's worse with music that I'm passionate about. Mm. Like it's, uh, it's easy for me to show up to some rock and roll gig and do what I would consider to be my best and be okay with the situation of the rhythm section or whatever, because I'm not super passionate about that music. So I get, I get enjoyment out of it in other ways. Mm. Um, but when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to black American music, like when it comes to straight ahead swing and all that, um, yeah, if it's, if it's not happening, I'd almost just rather not do it. You know what I mean? Like, I'd rather stay home and, uh, I'd rather stay home and like, uh, have a, have a night out with, or have a night out with some friends or stay home and practice or, you know, stay home and listen to a record or whatever, than then play improvised music in a way that I'm like, wow, this just feels not genuine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there was something there was on your uh, list of talking points. There was something that we spoke about pretty recently that we haven't spoken about yet, which is um, uh, quitting, quitting yeah. gigs. Um, this this particular subject ties into me, ties in with me pretty seriously around the subject of your your podcasts and happiness and such like that. Is um, is the, just the, the the word we can use is honesty. You know, the word, the word we can use is honesty. It's just being honest about what you want and being honest about whether or not what you're doing is giving you what you want, you know? And, uh, one of the, one of the things I've kind of always found to be true in New Orleans is that there's always work, you know, there's, there's just always work. If you, if you're worried about not being able to find work, there's, there's always work. And I can't speak to the truth of that throughout the rest of the world. But it's, it's out there, you know what I mean? That, that living, the living is out there to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you find yourself in these situations where you've got like, you know, uh, a band that you play with that you just, you just, you just can't do it. You just don't like it. You know what I mean? But you find yourself doing it because it's, because it's assisting and paying your bills. It really comes down to that fundamental question of why are you making music? You know what I mean? Are you making music to pay your bills? Or are you making music because you have, uh, because on a fundamental level, you need to, and we are going to monetize that. But like on a fundamental level, you need to, you know what I mean? So if you find yourself in these situations with, with bands that just like aren't fulfilling you and you go home and you're just upset about it all the time and you're not enjoying yourself and you want to quit, the simple answer is you should quit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, there's somebody out there who wants that gig. There's somebody out there that will be happy playing that gig. And if that's not you, it's like, it's like almost your responsibility to acknowledge that it's not you. you know? Yeah. And I've, I've, you know, I don't know that I believe in like the powers of the universe, but I do find that, um, every time I, every time I, gain the courage to close a door that I've been afraid of closing a bunch of other doors open. Like people, people notice when you take your, when you take it seriously, mm -hmm. you know? Well, yeah. And it was funny. We had ran into each other at a coffee shop. This was like two weeks ago or something. Mm -hmm. And you had said that that had just come up and I was in a situation at that time where there was this regular, I was doing that I was very unhappy in and it was one of those things where like I was just not the right person mm -hmm. for the gig and the the people on the gig I just didn't get along with and I that it finally dawned on me like oh wait well, I like I don't need to be doing this why am I, why like, am I I'll be okay this? with that why am I doing this and I had been nervous about you know quitting which is uh totally like a a very looked down upon thing in American culture. You know, it's like, we're not quitters. Um, <laughs> uh, and, but I, it was, I didn't want to feel like I was letting like this band down or whatever, but I 
realized it from that perspective that it was I'm I'm doing them a disservice by being in this band. Absolutely. Like and they you... deserve someone who wants to be here. And I it might be hard for them at first to find a new person, like it'll be stressful, but they'll probably find themselves in a better situation soon. Well, and more and more, you know, more importantly, you you may or may not have experienced this already, but like I it took me a while to learn that I can that I can outgrow things. It took me a while mm. to learn that to learn that uh, stepping away from projects that I'm no longer passionate about or that no longer fulfill me is is an option. Uh, and I got fired from bands that I didn't enjoy. Mm-hmm. So is this is a situation where like if you're not happy there, it's going to create a hostile unhappiness throughout the entire band. You're not, you're never going to be able to hide the fact that you're unhappy. Even if you like put on a smile and show up, like they're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's going to be that, there's going to be that little hint of you're not being genuine. Yeah. That somebody's going to pick up on and it's going to cause animosity throughout the band and you're going to end up getting fired anyway. I found the majority the the majority of times I've been fired, it was because I was supposed to. I was younger, and it was it was because I was supposed to quit that band already. You know what I mean? It was because yeah. I was already supposed to quit that band. I didn't. I kept doing it because I thought I needed the money. And then a few more months down the road, I was just they fired. They'd fire me, and probably for good reason. Yeah, you know, probably for good reason because they were a, they weren't able to be happy with my participation there anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like like there's nothing there's nothing inherently wrong with quitting. It's it's really comes down to that word which that word of honesty, which is just like, why are you doing this? Um, why should you keep doing this? Or why should you quit? And like, yeah, just be be honest about it you know what i mean yeah and that uh that 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 really went a long way immediately in my life toward creating more longevity in this in this art form in this career Mm -hmm. just just being honest about recognizing that like at a certain point the first and foremost thing you need to prioritize in your work is your your long-term happiness yeah well and i totally agree and I immediately was like, oh, I need to do that. And I <laughs> yeah. quit this group that I was in. And you're right, like a new door opened up where like something filled that slot even. Like it was like the same time frame that I was much happier about. It was it was weird how quickly it happened. But I think you brought up something that is a really important point, And that's that like you're going to outgrow things. And I think part of making the decision to be a musician is that you're going to be going through this process of finding a style of music or a thing that you want to do and then finding an opportunity to make money doing it, you know, mm-hmm. continue mm-hmm. your career. And then you're, even if it's an awesome thing, you'll probably outgrow it because you've lived that experience, you have this desire, and now you've accomplished it. And now you're going to have another thing and you're going to kind of have to restart, but it gets easier when you do it, you know? But understanding going in that, you're probably not going to be in the Rolling Stones and play for decades as like a unit doing this one thing, you know? Right. You're probably going to just go through a lot of different things and that should be exciting. But you have to understand that it's, it's a rotation of exploring these different things that interest you. Well, and that's, and that's why like for me, another thing around like picking the right guys for the job, it's like for, for me, it's not enough to be killing you need to still be getting better. Yeah. Like you can be, you can be monstrously better than I am. But if, if you've been that same level of monstrously better for the past, you know, 10 years and you're, you, you don't seem to be like dedicated still to the advancement of your personal growth, your personal art. I find myself like not really wanting to be around you, mm. you know what I mean? Because I'm like, there's something. It's it's for me. It's got to be about growth. It's got to be about moving forward. I don't need you to be. I don't like 
too much i don't like this you know put too much stock in words like better than or worse than because it's like for me it's just about like are you moving forward yeah. if you're if you're moving forward i want to know i want to hear you i want to know what you're up to i want to i want to participate in this art form with you if you want to come over to my house and shed and you think like for some reason you think that i'm like better than you and that you you're not worthy of covering over to my house and shedding i'm like why <laughs> i just yeah you know you want to be better killing let's mm-hmm. do it <laughs> you know yeah but uh it's 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 a uh, it's yeah it's 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 hard to to keep that in mind sometimes that every every human being in this world has a different relationship with music than you do you know there's no there are no two people in this world that that want exactly the same thing in 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 this art form or that enjoy exactly the same thing in this art form you can find people with a lot of similarities but there's nobody in this world that has the exact relationship with music that you do, which means that there are going to be people that don't take it as seriously as you. And that means there are going to be people that take it more seriously than you, no matter who you are. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care who you are. There's somebody out there that takes it more seriously than you. Unless like, I don't know, like maybe you're Nicholas Payton. And which, you know what I mean? Like maybe there's like, and even then I bet you, I bet you Nick would say that there, that he has, uh, mentors and people in this world that he thinks take this more seriously than he does and that inspire him to take it more seriously yeah you know, like. well and maybe it's just maybe not more seriously which is mm. they have a different perspective that maybe is more serious in certain areas and yes. you realize that oh there's holes in my perspective but there's certain perspectives that i've gone deeper on than they have you know and i think winton has like a quote i think it's like daily practice is a sign of morality mm, like you know that. in a musician and i think it's that thing of like when you're if you're playing with people who don't have that i don't know maybe it's like hope that, that there's drive, something that deeper you know keep going yeah that. like they're they're still searching for that light at the end of the tunnel or whatever there is like this thing that this intangible thing that's gone like yeah. and i don't know but it, it, you know, the, so there's, there's also it just comes down to there's, there's the combination of a few things that we've spoken about. The um, One, that when I say that everybody has a different relationship with music, and two, when I say this is really hard. Mm. So it's, you know, you go to, like students go to uh, like jazz school and they walk out of these jazz programs with this, this, this kind of do or die mentality it's like either either i'm playing complex contemporary killing jazz music or i just shouldn't do this you know what i mean and it's like when i say that everybody has a different relationship with music and 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 that it's difficult and in relation to your happiness it's you're never going to be happy doing something that is disingenuous that is disingenuous to like your being and your mm. heart so it's like it, these jazz programs kind of convince you that you need to play a certain way to be killing and like you know i'm not i'm not the arbiter on what is killing and what is not killing but i'm here to tell you that like if you don't want to be a quote unquote jazz musician like that's fine you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's like, that's not the only way to be killing. Mm-hmm. That's not the only way to be happy. Um, you know what I mean? So it's, it's just yeah. like, there are so many other facets of music and you shouldn't have to succumb to the, the word I like to use is jazz guilt. Like you shouldn't have to succumb to jazz guilt and succumb to like what other people think successful looks like. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. everybody has a different relationship with music. It's your job as an artist to dig deep into yourself and really hone in on what is it that you have to say and how do you want to say it? You know what I mean? Like if you're, if you are an artist, uh, like I, I, I really do want to believe that the trumpet is just the medium in which I choose to express myself. Yeah. And that if I woke up tomorrow and I had some sort of lock jaw and a doctor told me that I couldn't play the trumpet anymore, that I would, on a fundamental level still need to find a way to get my point across or to say what I need to say. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, yeah. 
can, uh, striving to be genuine and honest with yourself and then and then following up from that to recognize that in doing so you are not lesser than anyone else and how good you are at this at this thing that we do has no bearing over how good of a person you are mm -hmm. you know and being a trumpet player or being a musician is only one thing in the list of a million things that I am and not letting like I fall in love with the process and I obsess with the process but I refuse to let the process convince me that I am like less than good of yeah. a person as a person you know mm -hmm. it's uh it's, it's dangerous because th to continue that's the thought sorry I'm so jumbled now <laughs> uh, of like these mu sometimes these university music programs these students walk away with this feeling that like if they are not good they're not a good person yeah like if they are not if they're not crushing it that you shouldn't want to talk to them yeah and if they um, play what they think is a bad solo that you should yeah you should not want to talk to them or yeah. that the musicians who have figured out some technical stuff more than others who can like quote unquote play yeah but they're actually kind of pretty shady people that you're uncomfortable being around but everyone looks up to them because they can play faster you know yeah or or, or recognizing that like or maybe you know, maybe they are good maybe they are good people but that's the thing is that how well they play their instrument has no bearing over whether or not yeah. they're good people mm -hmm. you know like and it's it's really hard to disassociate ourselves from that and remember that at the end of the day you get to put that instrument in the case you know, at the end of the day, like you can walk down the street and people, people can look at you and not know that you're a trumpet player. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you've got to be, you've got to be healthy and happy as a person. You can't, you can't just look to music to define your health and your happiness and your self-worth. 100%. Yeah. Oh, cool. This has all been awesome, man. Yeah. I hope, I, I hope I'm not rambling too much. <laughs> I mean, that's the point of long form podcasting. <laughs> Freedom to ramble. Um, with that, I think we'll move on to these coda questions and we'll get out of here. Right, right. So, five short answer questions before we take the coda and head out. And the first one is, what's your go-to feel-good album? Oh, man. Uh, my go-to feel-good album would probably... I, I would say there's been a few records that have really had stay power in my life. Um, one of which is a uh, Hank Mobley soul station. Uh, that record, that record really helped me kick my jazz guilt. Mm. You know, that record really helped me understand that like the blues was something to lean into, you know, not something to, not something to like shy away from because you think it's like, well, oh, we need to play all the bebop. Like, yeah, no, I listen to Hank Mobley playing, all that language and all that blues and the band's just swinging out so hard. Like, yeah, oftentimes, oftentimes if I'm not feeling great, I'll put on mm -hmm. Soul Station. Um, Chet Baker Sings, give me another one. I know you asked for one, but I'm going to give you some. <laughs> uh, Chet Baker Sings and uh, um, Clifford Brown with Strings and uh, Nick at Night by Nicholas Payton. I don't know, that's I'll, I'll call it there because I cool. just have I have so many albums that I could, yeah it's hard for me to pick one mm -hmm. no I, that's always the case but yeah uh, the next one is what's some advice about happiness that you've gotten that really resonated with you I've received a few pieces of advice in my lifetime that I would say I digested and was able to take with out a grain of salt mm. uh, things that things that people said that resonated with me in a way that was just so fundamentally true that I had no I had no rebuttal for it you yeah. know um, Hans Verhoeven uh, the drum instructor of my undergrad I went to Vancouver Island University a uh, dear friend of mine and he was upset and in front of the in front of the students, he gave a, a big speech. And at one point in the speech, uh, he said, "In behaving professionally, we become professionals." Um, so Hans Verhoeven, in behaving professionally, we become professionals. Uh, Ed Peterson, from my time at UNO, one of the greatest saxophone players alive, Ed said to me, 
you will never be called for a gig you're not supposed to be on. So it's important. And, you know, in relating to happiness, it's just it, when you are, when you are there, when you're on the gig, when you're in whatever situation it is that you were called for, enjoy it. Hmm. You know, I, I know it's an oxymoron to be like, try not to be nervous, but like, enjoy it because you were called to be there for a reason. And that reason is not because you tricked anybody. That reason is not because you talked yourself up. That reason is not because you have a um, hundred thousand Instagram followers on your jazz uh, Instagram page. That reason is because you're supposed to be there. Hmm. That reason is because those musicians have heard you. They know what you're capable of. They assess the situation and you are there. So it's like, enjoy it. You know, you, you won't, you only get called for gigs that you're supposed to be on. Um, Jason Marshall plays Barry saxophone for the uh, Roy Hargrove big band and the Mingus big band and, uh, and for a time at the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. Uh, Jason told me that this is an hours game. And if you just continue to dedicate yourself, like genuinely dedicate yourself to this music, you will watch over the years as people you thought were better than you and people you thought were worse than you fall at the wayside because they just didn't have the stay power that you had. And after however many years, you'll find yourself at the top of some kind of heap, you know, mm -hmm. but it's just like these, these things in relation to happiness, it's just like, when, when it's like, you got to fall in love with the process. You know what I mean? You can't be, you can't be looking to outside um, influence to tell you that you're good at this. You can't be looking to, um, to like kind of like milestones and markers as much as it's like, but yeah, it's always good to have something to work toward, but you got to remember that like, this is an hours game. And if you just keep dedicating yourself to it, and if you can keep, if you can keep finding a way to love dedicating yourself to it, it's, you know, the longevity is, is just there. Yeah. Um, John Clayton said to me, uh, when, when somebody asked him about, uh, networking and not about, um, how he deals with navigating, um, that like need to create personal relationships with people to get better work and stuff. And he said, you will always receive work based, based on the level of your art, you know? And, uh, that's not to say, uh, that's not to say being killing in itself is enough, but he's, it is to say that like, be killing, really dedicate yourself to it and watch as that, and, and that will be rewarded, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so these, these pieces of advice have really kind of helped sculpt the type of musician that I am. However, they kind of work in hand with the fact that like, it's, it's just, it's just none of that matters if you suck as a person, <laughs> you know, like it's, yeah. it's, and, uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying you need to go out there and like volunteer more or anything like that, but I am saying like, just be a good person and dedicate to yourself to this music and like watch as like, if you can kind of focus in on that first one, that the second one starts to fall into place. Yeah. And that like, that second one will be, um, will be more fruitful, mm -hmm. you know, like that. Nah, okay. Now, now I'm going, now I'm going back and forth. This, this, this is important though. I promise. Uh, I, um. I used, I used to have a lot of negativity when I, when I got to, into school for music, I developed a very, very serious performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to play the trumpet in front of people who had clipboards, especially. Um, and it took me years. This is, if you, if you listen to the rest of this podcast and thought that you got nothing out of it, please at least listen to this part is that. I, I, it took me years to recognize that the criticisms that I was given and the things that I was saying out loud and the things that I were thinking to myself were not founded in, were not founded in an actual love of the music and were not founded in, des in a desire for the music to be better. They were founded in jealousy and they were founded in intimidation and they were founded in, uh, in, in hate. You know, like I used to, 
And when you open up those doors and you criticize other artists and other musicians in an, in a, in a way that is a projection of your own insecurities, instead of in a way that is genuinely asking, what does the music need? Uh, you open up that door for yourself as well. When you put that, when you put ne actual negativity on the world, I'm not saying like, don't give criticism, but I am saying like, when you put out unnecessary negativity out into the world, especially with your criticisms, that opens up that door inside your heart to recognize that those criticisms and that negativity comes back to you, mm. you know? Yeah. And when I, when I, when I genuinely became more okay with myself and I started focusing my efforts on lifting up those around me instead of lifting myself up above them, uh, I found my performance anxiety went away. I found my hands stopped shaking. I found my, uh, my breath stopped being so shallow. I found, you know, every, everything that was negative just went away because I wasn't putting it out into the world, you know, and that's, that's just like the most fundamental thing about being an artist and being a musician is you need to remember that, like, that has no bearing on the world. If you suck. <laughs> like, yeah, so, so true. Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah it was thank so you. No, thank you for sharing that. I feel like, you just preemptively answered the next question, which was like advice you'd give. And that was just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, be, be, yeah, that's it. That's it. Be honest, be honest, be genuine. Uh, and, and don't, and yeah, don't, don't put negativity out there for the sake of it. Mm. You know what I mean? And don't, um, don't, don't, um, <laughs> don't just, don't just repeat things that you're, that your teachers said to you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, the number of times I've heard uh, young musicians be like, yeah, man, you know, like, well, man, but you know, the thing is, you know, you kind of sit in a little bit too far, you know, you sit a little bit in front of the beat and like, bah, and saying some shit where I'm like, bruh, I know, I, I hear you. You think I'm not listening to you when you play? I know what you have a grasp on and what you don't have a grasp on. And when you're saying, when you're talking about things that it's, it's clear to me that you haven't actually digested for yourself, but you're just like repeating stuff that you heard other musicians say that it's like, what was the point of saying it at all? Mm. You know what I mean? Like be honest, be genuine, only, only say things that serve the music and, and also try and remember that criticism is to be asked for, mm. you know what I mean? Like, uh, Unless, unless you actually on some fundamental level believe that you are the arbiter of, of that subject. Like if there is, if you, if, if you know, it's like a, a, a young student of yours and they're on the gig with you and you genuinely like on a fundamental level believe that they need to hear the thing that you have to say, then like by all means, you know, pass on your wisdom. But, uh, but criticisms just in themselves are to be asked for, you know what I mean? Because, because like I said, everybody's got a different relationship with music and the person that you're giving that criticism to might have zero interest in, may have zero interest in actually being the musician that you're telling them to be. Yeah. And it's like, you know, when, when people come to you and they ask you for your advice, be warm with it, be great, be, be gracious with it, be generous with it. But, uh, don't try not to thrust yourself upon people. Yeah, I like it a lot. Cool. Um, is there a particular musician in your life who you view as being a happy, healthy, and fulfilling person or maybe adds those qualities to your own life? They're that kind of person who has that kind of light to them. Whoa, and, well, my, everybody in my band, mm -hmm. everybody everybody that I hire yeah. has has that light in them. I don't think, I don't think that light is... Um, I don't think that light is hard to come by. You know, I think, I think musicians deal with a lot of negative emotions. I think we deal with a lot of insecurities, but that's not to say that those people aren't also shining lights themselves. Mm, yeah. Um, and, uh, a lot of my mentors, you know, um, Ashlyn, Ashlyn Parker here in New Orleans has, uh, really helped me dedicate myself to being part of a lineage and to, uh, 
and just striving to, to being part of a community. You know, we have Trumpet Mafia and we, we really, it's, it's been really good for me to, to be part of something that's just so much greater than myself Yeah. to, uh, to recognize, to recognize that it's not about me and it's not about me getting mine. It's about community mm. and how you can best serve that community, you know? Um, uh, so it's a lot of, a lot of my mentors, man, uh, Mr. Brunius, Wendell Brunius here in town, you know, he's got, he's got his head on straight. He's got priorities, yeah. you know, and those, and I also find that like, you know, I'm not trying to say that older musicians necessarily know more, but older musicians kind of know more <laughs> they've been around. They've been around the block more times than us. They have families. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, um, musicians like Wendell have figured out how to do this every night and how to, uh, support their family. And those, those things just like supporting your family just seems so much more important than judging yourself, you know, like <laughs> very true. Yeah. So it's just, there's, yeah. I hope that answers the question. Just like, yeah, I see it in, I see it in, in countless musicians that I surround myself with. Yeah. And I think good. that also has part to do with like, if that's not your MO, I don't make, I don't really make time for you. <laughs> <laughs> I like it a lot. Um, the last one is just, what do you think your purpose as a musician is? I think my, my personal purpose as a musician, and I'm, I'm, I, I hope when I say these, when I say whatever it is that I say, <laughs> that, uh, that people don't take this as me telling others how they need to be, because I don't think much as I think, uh, every person has a different relationship with music. I think every every musician maybe has a different purpose in this music. Yeah. Um, I like to believe that my purpose in this music is to is to dedicate it, dedicate myself to it in such a way that uh, the elders and ancestors of this music are able to are able to come through me mm. as some sort of conduit. You know, like I, I, I really do on a fundamental level, like I don't, I don't need to be famous. I don't, I don't need, I don't need to make more money than it takes to support my family. Um, but what I, what I do need on some fundamental level is to, is to be part of that lineage, you know, is to, uh, is to have the who those who came before me speak through me yeah no i love that it's great well cool man this has all been awesome and before we're done if you want you can put them in the plug zone and let them know about any places online you'd like to send them or projects you want them to be aware about just let the listeners know what you want them to know about <laughs> oh great um well um you know we we put out a we put out a new record um, I say new, jazz records, oh, jazz, uh, you know, they're, they're new for like six years apparently these days. That's so but, true. Um, <laughs> I'll be like, cats will be like, dude, you see my new record came out in 2012. Uh, but, that uh, is you know. so true, man. So yeah, so we put out a, we put out a record last April. It's entitled, uh, it's under the name Jonathan Bauer. It's called Walk, Don't Run. Uh, you can find it on all streaming services, you know, Apple Music and Spotify and Deezer and Tidal and Napster and all that. So if you if you want to see what we're about, that was our latest record. Uh, we are also in the process of finishing up the arranging for our next record, which I'm hoping will come out in the fall. Uh, so you can keep an eye on us through our website, www.jonathanbowermusic.com or our Facebook at Jonathan Bauer Music, or Instagram at jbauermusic. Um, also, uh, you know, as, as musicians, if you're in New Orleans and you are listening to this and you haven't already done so, uh, please consider uh, reaching out to the Musicians Clinic and, you know, making, making an appointment uh, to become a member of the Musicians Clinic. There's a lot of, there's a lot of the, uh, there's just, a, there's just a lot of tools available to us that you may not be aware of from, you know, getting, getting uh, uh, earplugs to finding 
uh, sliding scale therapy sessions, you know, like yeah. musicians in New Orleans are uh, able to get pay as, as little as I think twelve dollars for a ther for a session with a with a therapist that works through the uh, musicians musicians clinic. So when we're talking about happiness and mm -hmm. health, like yeah. these things are available to us, and you should take advantage of them. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Jonathan. Thanks for being here. No, no problem. Thanks for having me. Okay, that does it for this week's episode of the Happy Musicians Podcast. Right now, we're listening to a track from Jonathan's Walked Out Run. This is Chatting. Thank you so much for listening and supporting the podcast. If you're enjoying it, you might also enjoy sharing it with other people. They might enjoy it, too. There's a lot of people out there that could use this message, and you can help us reach them. You can play a personal role by telling your friends about it. There are so many free ways to help the show. Spread the message, share it on social media, use our hashtag, hashtag happy musician. You can subscribe to the show so you know immediately whenever we release new content. And you could leave us a rating and even a review in whatever app or service you use to listen to this. That is amazingly helpful. I also want to let you know about our website, thehappymusicians.com. There you can find show notes that have links to everything we talk about and highlight some of the actionable advice that the guests share and some descriptions to help you kind of decipher the messages hidden within long-form podcasts. Thank you again for taking the time and attention out of your day to listen to the show. Hope you got something out of it, and I hope you'll join us again next week. Thank you so much, and stay happy.